Hi, my name is Paul, and welcome to part four of our six-part series on internationalization and Next.js. We've obviously come a long way by this point. You're getting semi-pro if you followed us all the way through up to this point. But as with each of the first two videos and our third video, we left a number of questions outstanding, and they're fairly big, uh, like, workflow type question. And in this video, we want to uh, address actually all of those. By the end of this video, we will have no outstanding questions that have been opened in previous videos. Uh, I very much view this video at, well, one, this has been the one that I've been looking forward to for the whole series, actually, because I think the, the solutions that we propose here um, are going to be pretty transformative for a lot of teams. So, um, and also it's, you know, I would say the, the climax of the series in terms of like the most interesting part, probably for the biggest uh, audience, you know, this I, video I think is useful for both uh, the developer audience, also for the business audience. Um, you know, I don't want to scare off the developers by saying this is another non code video, um, but it, it really is worth sticking around. Um, I think it'll help you look at things in a way that you haven't necessarily previously from a workflow standpoint. So, um, that said, just a quick intro for me. As I mentioned, my name is Paul. I'm the founder of Render. We are a custom software development shop. If you need that sort of thing, Use the link in the description to reach out to us. Okay, let's jump right into it. So as we talked about last week, there's a lot of workflow issues with regard to internationalization. There's the whole JSON file thing. You know, either you have to ask your business team, uh, assuming that you're working on a team of some size, uh, you have to ask your business team to either work with JSON, which you as a developer probably don't want them doing, um, or you have to transform that into, let's say, CSV or Excel. Then they either take that and use that internally it's sent off externally to your contractors to translate, et cetera, uh, comes back and hopefully the keys haven't been changed. Then you got to transform that back into JSON. Then you got to import that. It's kind of a nightmare. That process can take hours, days, weeks, even a month, right? Um, so what we want to do here is show you the pattern that we use on our projects to avoid that whole mess. And so I want to start off by, before I show you exactly what we do, I want to show you the versions of things that we've run across previously that kind of tried to address this solution, but I don't think have. So, okay, so if you're already aware of a number of the problems that I mentioned, um, you probably heard of a service called Lokize. Um, you know, it, it does it does a decent job of making your keys and values available for storage on a service. Um, the nuts and bolts of connecting everything to it, I don't love. Uh, and also, I just, you know, I have to say, I'm not huge on the UI. Um, I don't mean to criticize the work of this team, but it's not something that's really worked really well for us. Um, it They make an attempt to kind of go through things here. I'm um, just showing an example. And, you know, here's how they have it. So we have your key here, and then you can go to your languages, and I don't know. I don't love it. It's, it's just an enormous amount of scrolling to get through what I want. Um, so that, that's that one. Um, then also uh, another pattern that I've seen used for trying to address this is like what we see on Directus. If you don't know Directus, it's, um, you could think of it kind of as like a no or low code um, SaaS tool builder. Um, and they do a lot of stuff really, really well. It's a super impressive platform. But um, one thing I think they don't do great is translations. And they kind of make the assumption that I've seen a lot of other platforms make. So uh, don't mean to call out their platform in a negative way here but this is just a pattern that i think isn't really sufficiently developed so you know it's it's this thing right so let's say i'm doing like hero dot you know or like you know home dot hero dot title and then we're going to add this to this and then we're going to put our value and then we want to come back here and we want to you know have this be another language so home dot hero dot title and so it's this kind of thing where it's like, okay, um, I've done two keys now. Let me go ahead and do my third one for home, not hero, not title. And like, okay, so just to give me an example, you know, I've gone through three locales now with all of that process um, for one key. And on our site, uh, we have something like five or 600 keys, something like that. And so to go through all of the locales, we're talking thousands of times going to that UI. Now, they have an import and export thing. Um, I don't love that either because it still requires that you've transformed your JSON keys into some sort of um, like a CSV format, right? Um, and it requires coordination in a way that I don't think it should have to. 
Now, the uh, a closer model that I've seen is something like this that I think does an almost correct job of uh, going of giving you the UI that you actually need to be able to work across teams on this. So, for instance, imagine you are on the dev team. Um, you've added a new feature. You want to add, say, your your default locale value um, for for us that would be English, obviously. So, you know, we enter about us, learn more, etc. Um, then uh, you would hand that off to the business team. They need to then go and add your key, choosing every language. So it's not quite the same thing where we're not bouncing back to some main screen and then have to go and open our modal or our screen again. Um, but I do have to go and actually enter the key in English, in French, in, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not great. Um, you still have to do lots of metadata, lots of, I don't know, it's just, it's more clicking than it really should ought to be. So let's now go on to the solution that we've built and that we use on projects at render. So uh, this is basically what things look like. So we're logged in here to our backend. Um, we just have the keys over on the left. We have our default locale as a second column and then every other uh, language is just over here to the right, right? So if we want to add another locale, it's not super hard to see pretty much everything that we want in one view or to do a little bit of scrolling. Obviously, you could set up your view here to lock these first two columns, etc. cetera. Um, but the point is that this actually works really well. Go back here. This actually works really well whether you are doing machine translation or human translation. Now, I'm going to start with machine translation because that's the view that I have set up here first. So let me jump back over here to this. All right, so I want to enter a new key. Um, I'm going to do home.hero.fun. All right, so... We're going to add that and I want to say fun and then go ahead and save that. And then now I just hit this thing. We're hooked up to the DBEL API. It's going to go and auto translate everything. Boom. I can go ahead and drop this key into my code base, use it. It'll be live immediately. So that to me is how to do this, right? That's a really great pattern. Um, I'm not exchanging files. I'm not using like crappy UI, um, et cetera. So that manages what we want to do for like static content, like the, you know, the top bar, the, the, the Chrome, so to speak of your site, anything that's not like blog posts or, or that sort of content. Um, we have our whole UI here, boom, everything's in there, ton of, ton of keys, et cetera. So that's great. Um, we can also show the keys to see when things were last updated. Um, we can, you know, filter our keys. I can go about uh, hero, right? Um, so that's, that's really nice. All right, let's look at what this process or what this interface would need to do for us to be able to use this for human translations. So let's consider for a minute. Um, say I have 10 locales um, and I don't happen to speak all 10 of those languages. Well, I'm probably, in, and I want to use human translations. Well, I'm probably going to be working with an external vendor, right? Um, and I probably don't necessarily want to give them access to all the content for all the languages. Maybe they, you know, I've hired them for German and they think they speak French, but they actually don't. So they, they try to do me a favor and fix something that they actually break or the context is wrong or something, right? Um, or just, I just don't really feel like giving more trust than is actually needed. I just want the person hired to do French to, to see French, right? So let me show you what that's like. Okay, so we have hired Monsieur Jacques Soccer Bleu to translate our English UI into French for us. And as you can see, his view is a little bit different than what we had with the, the admin view. He can just see the key English and French. Now the key is provided to basically give context on the translation. Sometimes short labels don't always give you the perfect idea of what's intended. Uh, the translator normally isn't looking at your UI when they're translating. So um, kind of the idea of making that available. They of course cannot change that key. Uh, but they can see what it is. So then they'll see, of course, the default locale value, the, the value that they're translating from, um, and then the value that they should be entering. So then note also here that the, um, the machine translation keys, in this instance, we have as, uh, as disabled so that they can't kind of just go through and do things in a, let's say, overly efficient way. Um, you know, you can obviously choose to enable those or not for your project. But uh, the point is, there's no fileless change. It's just they log in, boom, they save their work. It's available immediately. Uh, if you wanted to include an approval process, you could, of course, do that as well so that the their updates don't necessarily go live immediately. Um, you could add, you know, a little button here as well to to accomplish that. 
uh, make it so that you know you approve this key but not that key or this key needs to go back for for a review or something like that there's a lot of ways that you can enhance this you could add a little button over here to the right to say you know log in and retranslate just this one key um so this to me is the way that people ought to be doing this which actually brings us to the end of the video here um you know as i said i i don't understand why our ui that we've designed for this and have used another project isn't just the way that this is done that everybody does this it's so plainly obvious i feel like after you see it that this is just the only way the other ones are an attempt at iterating on the process but um i don't know the first time i ran into these challenges this is the picture that i saw in my head of the way that this ought to be and so we built this we've been using it and it's been great for you know for efficiency for working across teams etc okay so as i said that's basically it for this week um i think i hope that you find the value in this and understand how this really just solves every open question that we've had so far so far because there are going to be new ones that we're going to pose in uh, next week's video. But we actually hope for that week to be, or for that video to be pretty self contained. So it'll be back to code, um, probably back to the longer format that we've been doing so far. And then after that, we will have one more left, and you will be an internationalization pro. So if you got some value out of this video, drop us a like below, subscribe to catch the rest of the series, and we will see you next week. That's nobody's talking to you. I'm talking to these guys. So, welcome to part four of our six part series on internationalization.